Peace, Baba Glenda here. Um, just putting my two cents in about uh, some of the things uh, going on. And of course, the Black Panther is in, you know, on everybody's lips. Um, you know, so many different uh, opinions and persuasions about the, uh, the movie itself. I did get a chance to see it, enjoyed it, uh, enjoyed it immensely. Of course, you know, there are some things inside of it, but overall, I think the movie was positive. You know, um, the whole dichotomy that was uh, thrust together between Killmonger and T'Challa, um, you know, is a, uh, you know, is something to be thought about in philosophy classes and debates and things like that. But as far as uh, the movie is concerned, I think it put a lot of people to work. Um, the whole um, thing about how much uh, we're giving to Disney and what you've been giving Disney money all along, uh, you know, from Snow White in, 19, <laughs> 19, in the 1930s up until today with the Beauty and the Beast and uh, Aladdin and, you know, all these different types of movies that Disney puts out. And Disney is the master of uh, subliminal seduction. So, you know, that all of its movies have, you know, uh, pornography in it and uh, mind control traps and things like that. And, you know, uh, so you have to expect those things from Disney because that's what they've been doing since Uncle Walt was, you know, <laughs> abusing the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's one of those things. You know, uh, people have been saying, well, he saved the white guy and wouldn't save uh, his own cousin, but he did offer to, you know, he said we could help you. The brother said, no, I rather. Um, be you know buried at sea then to uh be part of this because y'all gonna put me in jail because i killed a few folks and stuff like that and you know it's something that uh something that happened in the movie uh my biggest uh, pet peeve on the whole movie of course is the lack of understanding and being a, a martial artist myself and dealing with uh Dora Milaje, uh, the the women fighters and things like that, and dealing with uh, the Panther style of fighting, the heart shaped herb that was supposed to give him the Panther power. You know, people are saying, well, he was a drug addict because the only way he got his Panther power was through was through drugs and things like that. And it shows just a lack of understanding of what these things are in the true African sense. You know, uh, number one, uh, the Panther is an actual uh, warrior society, a secret society in Africa, in the Congo. Um, and they have other leopard societies uh, throughout different places in West Africa and things like that. They had the Amatiga, which were the, what they call the werewolves of the savannah, where in this particular um, wolf or dog, you know, human beings would shape shift into those. and. That was basically taken to Central America with uh, Abubakar II when he abdicated uh, being the Mansa and let his brother be the Mansa. And he went off uh, on the second expedition into the Atlantic across over into, you know, South America. You know, that's why you have uh, different African dynamics over there that blended in and merged with the South American, uh, South American cultures. But there is an actual Black Panther society, so stop saying that it's a uh, that they just made it up. No, and there were several several renditions of Black Panther in comic books prior to the Jack Kirby rendition of the Black Panther. And I say Jack Kirby again because Stan Lee, of course, now that Jack Kirby's dead, Steve Ditko. I don't know if he's still alive or he's just in limbo somewhere. But it has to be pretty uh, pretty old by now. I guess at least as old as Stan Lee. Um, they both disputed Stan Lee's claims to uh, the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, of which the Black Panther 
uh, was all part of that whole thing. Also, now Stan, now 50 years later and 60 years later, Stan Lee is saying that he was the creator of the, you know, different characters and things like that. But that's not what the magazines themselves say when it said that there was a coalition. And basically, it wasn't even a coalition because later interviews with Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, you know, Stan basically he was the editor. He was the uh, later became the publisher of Marvel, um, Marvel comic books, and he's the editor. You know, they run past. Hey, I got this uh, black character, the Black Panther. Um, I got some ideas on it. Okay, well, go ahead, Jack. Work that out. And let me see it. You know, that's not creating a character. There were precursor Black uh, Panther comic books. One was in a cowboy comic book, um, and the other one was in Africa. And also, again, as I say before, classified or declassified um, Nazi occult information by um, the Nazi Occult Bureau that went around the world looking for relics, um, information on different things. So the vibranium that folks are talking about is the Dogon super steel called Sagala. The Dormalaje are the minnow or our mothers, the uh, elite troops of the Dahomean um, army. They were called the wives of the leopards. So when you see that uh, depiction of what they call the strong sisters and sisters fighting and defending the country, that's not, yes, Gaddafi had some elite troops and things like that, but no, in the traditional African warrior sense, these women were much more fierce, uh, much more dexterous. They carried 24-inch top-heavy uh, top decapitating razors. They could, uh, at the time, the, the crude um, guns that they had, they were much more agile at taking the gun apart, putting it back together, working it if it got clogged up unclogging, all those things that they do in the army with the rifles, you know, where you got to break it down and put it back together and clean it and all those things. They were much faster than the men, and they had the, a greater endurance of pain. They had in Africa what they call war, th war towns, and these war towns, they were surrounded by what they would call devil thorns. They were thorns about um, on bushes that were about the size of my finger. Uh, sharp, and they would take these thorns and put them around the walls of the different town of the different war towns, so that um, you would, um, you know, it would be difficult to breach the town other than coming down the, the the actual lane up to the to the gates of the town and things like that. Um, so if a, if a town is encircled by a wall and you have these devil thorns packed up to the wall and out. Um, uh, you know, uh, 100 or 200 yards where if you want to go anywhere but down the lane uh, to get to the to the entrance of the town, you're going to have to climb these de devil storm thorns or these, yeah, these devil thorns. So the troops who were the wives of the leopard, they was all, the, all of these women were married to the king. Um, that, that's a whole other story. All of the all of the women who were the elite guards in the army um, were married to the king. Uh, they were celibate. They would practice. The women would run and jump up on the devil thorns and lay on the thorns, and they would form a road up to the wall so that the wall could be breached. In other words, the next woman would run up the back of the woman lay down and fall on the thorns. Then the next one would run up the back of those two, lay down and fall on the thorns until they had a bridge all the way from the beginning of the thorns all the way to the wall, which the rest of the women would run along their backs and jump over the wall and fight the town. Um, people, you know, uh, think that warfare and all of those things were um, not in Africa, that we weren't uh, that we weren't warriors. We were warriors. We were farmers. We were fishermen. We were um, 
gatherers, all of those different types of things. And we developed the sciences of cooking with herbs and different types of food where in, uh, when they talk about the technology of Wakanda and they say that uh, Wakanda was the, the most technologically advanced place in the world, um, up until you know the colonial period and stuff like that, Africa was Timbuktu, um, uh, going to Kemet, uh, Nigeria, Benin, all of these civilizations, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, all of these civilizations in Africa were much higher than the civilizations in other places. You know, uh, let's not let us not forget the Dark Ages. Where you know, uh, what do you do for a stomach ache? You eat, you eat a, <laughs> you eat a pickled toe of a human being, or something like that, or leeches and all that kind of stuff. Where they were doing eye surgery, you know, uh, and things like that, removing cataracts and things like that. That's a higher technology. You know, they weren't removing cataracts any time uh, close to close to <laughs> close up to now in in Europe, especially during the so-called Dark Ages. Um, so we have to take that into account. So there is a Black Panther society that exists to this day. They do panther fighting. They fight like panthers, just like the guerrilla society, of which was another contention, um, comparing uh, black people, human black people, to to animals as far as gorillas were concerned and things like that. They were a guerrilla clan. That was their clan totem, just like the Black Panther was the totem of Wakanda. It was nothing negative about that. I know the thing with the little boy with the shirt and um, the Scopes monkey trial in Tennessee back in the 20s, whatever, um, and the whole uh, paired off association. But that was the that was the 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 ape clan, the gorilla clan, just like you have the crocodile clan, just like you have the elephant society. You know, these type of things, these uh, different uh, hooking of the humans to animal totem is still in Africa today. You still have the bat clan and the the the, the clans of the Akan and things like that that are part of the warrior societies in Africa. So when the men get off together and the women get off together and the women do that, they have their things, they have their medicine, they have their drums and all that kind of stuff. You know, I know now, of course, you know, the, the big drum around is the djembe drum. And, you know, uh, it's actually an insult to the drum to be playing it, number one, if you're not a drummer. But the drums that people have anyway aren't the real djembe drums, so it really doesn't matter because every town has two or three um, Jimbe Jun Jun troops and you know um, like uh, Chief Bay and all those folks cats and things <laughs> Luke O'Shea and all them back in the day told me to say you're not a drummer I say well I know I'm not a drummer so they gave me the bell and then when I was trying to keep up with the bell they took me they took the bell from me and made me sit down because I'm not a drummer you know and if you're not a drummer you shouldn't be playing the drum you can be playing the drum. You know, I know everybody wants to get out and do the beats and, uh, excuse me, the, the, the tones and things like that, but it's not for everybody. It's not even for a few. Those are very, very spiritual and sacred drums that were downloaded from the dimension where the, where the, the actual instruments are alive, and they brought it to that part of the world. This is not, a, and I know it's going to hurt you, hurt your feelings, it's not a, a woman's drum. Women shouldn't play that drum. They shouldn't have the drum between their legs and playing the drum in between their legs because it's not a woman's drum. It's a man's drum for men. I know that hurts a lot of people. You got a lot of women drum troops out, a lot of women drummers. But women have their own drums. And you know what? The men can't play those drums and shouldn't play those drums. Only the women play those drums. So women should actually go and, and seek out their own sacred drums that are for women. There's nothing wrong with men having something and women having something that's not together, you know. And that's not, that's not old-fashioned, you know. Uh, when we be, we'd be in Africa and we'd be at the village, which is a fishing village, <clears throat> I had some people come to visit me. Um, we were there doing doing things at the... Um, at the compound and stuff like that, martial arts and stuff. And the folks came and said, uh, sisters came and said, you brothers the same 
all over the world. Said the, the sisters out there with the fish, selling the fish, working in the in the in noon sun and stuff like that. You know, they did have some shed. We say that women out there working, the men they sitting around the tree, you know, pontificating and talking stuff. Say y'all the same all over the world. <laughs> I said, yeah, but you know, you wasn't up at uh, two thirty, three o'clock in the morning when the men went out in the dark with no horizon out there in t on them waves and caught all that fish. They come back. It's seven, eight o'clock in the morning. It's eight o'clock in the morning. They had him some breakfast. They, sh they take a, a bath, a shower, you know, rest up a little bit and 11, 12 o'clock, they come out and sit around the tree because they, they, their work is done for the day. They, cause they, all that fish they caught, they gave to the women. Now the women go and do the women's part of it, which is sell the fish. So, you know, if you haven't seen what goes on through the whole cycle, you can't judge or talk about the cycle only seeing a part of it. So that djembe drum is a war drum. It's a secret drum. The real ones have shrines in them. They used to execute people with those drums. The tone, they time to a tree and plank, disrupt the central nervous system and they drop dead. That's all part of the technology that y'all don't know about because y'all just got drums playing them. Used to stand up, stand, stand and play the drum and fire coming out the back of the drums. The drums have their own house. The drums have their own house. The drums are fed and put in the house. And when they're in the house, nobody's in there. The drums are all in there and the drums are talking to each, talking to each other in the different tones and things like that inside of the house with nothing there. This is all that stuff that, you know, nobody believes, you know, they're talking about the Black Panther taking drugs to be the Black Panther. No, that's the Black Panther medicine, not the one in the, in the movie. It's actually a mushroom. <laughs> it's a hallucinogenic mushroom with other sacred formulas that were um, brought and downloaded from the from the from the medical planets um, from the pharmacological planets where all the different formulas and things like that are in the record rooms and in the libraries you know that you go into under the influence of the mushroom and you glean information bring it back write it down um, pass it on because it's taken from the uh, entheogenic, hallucinogenic, psychedelic realms that um, are there for us to gather information for, uh, from. So the panther medicine is a formula. It's a mushroom and different herbs. It is, the, it is the black powder. The black powder where you see where they put in the cuts. You know, but I shouldn't be telling y'all this. The black panthers be after me again because they were after me once. <laughs> They were asking me once before back in the early 80s when I did a martial arts video and I revealed too much uh, while people were telling me, oh, well, that ain't African. That's too sophisticated. That's too sophisticated to be African martial arts. It must be Salat or must be uh, Kuk Sulwan or something, but it couldn't be African because it's too sophisticated because I showed some things that nobody even knew that I was showing, so it didn't make any difference other than to the people that thought I shouldn't have showed it. So that's another story. I'll put that in. Uh, that's, that's going in my book. But um, the mushroom that's used, the panther mushroom, that's used for martial arts information, now, you won't get this from the regular martial arts, regular martial arts people. I don't care who they are, what styles, because they don't have the old martial arts. They don't have the ancient martial arts. All of the martial arts you see, basically the MMA, the different karate's and all that kind of stuff, that's all modern. That's all new. Um, it doesn't go back to the old martial arts where you're training entheogenically once you get past the fighting portion of it and you um, move to gather power because you're fighting novel entities and novel creatures in the hyperdimensional realms. You know, some folks try to say, well, I couldn't associate any type of violence with mushrooms, things like that. But there's a deeper plenum of information that, that you could ever imagine. Every single thing that you could ever think of and things that you could never think of and things that no one could ever think of are inside of the record 
uh, record information and technology of those uh, of those mushrooms, and you know uh, DMT, the DMT compendium compendium of martial arts uh, and knowledge. So the uh, the Japanese have the same mushroom because it's a mushroom that uh, um, brought itself to Earth <laughs> to pass on information. It is a a martial mushroom informational system. They call it the Tingutaki, where you eat the mushrooms on the sacred martial mountain and uh, you download information from the Tingu, which are the what they call the mountain goblins. The mountain goblins, they have human bodies with the head of a bird, wings, bird's feet, but they're human too uh, because they can talk and disappear and change shape and you know, all those different type of things and move great distances in a moment's notice and take you along with them. Those are the ones who taught um, uh, the different levels of swordsmanship, uh, taught ninjutsu and all that kind of stuff. And they had the same thing in Indonesia. They had the same thing in Korea. They had the same thing at the Shaolin Temple. They were using mushrooms and hallucinogens, and they were using it up in Tibet too. I know everybody thinks that all they did it was sit around and breathe and chant you know, and all that kind of stuff, but no, they were using the same thing. So the Black Panther utilizing a herb from a uh, from a flower to gain his uh, Black Panther um, knowledge and skill is nothing that is not part of the actual traditional um, martial knowledge and information of Africa, like it is in other parts of the world, including the Australian uh, so-called Aborigines, you know, this information is not general public information, but there is a Black Panther Society that exists to today, you know, not gone in the past. There are Black Panthers out there they're now, you know. So Black Panther fever is going on, but it is a real and actual thing. The actual um, knowledge base, because they say Stan Lee made it, you know, Stan Lee created the Black Panther, Stan Lee. No, Stan Lee didn't create the Black Panther. As I said before, he was the editor. We got to, you know, he and, and he did uh, pin some of the, the story part after uh, the other guys told him the story. Here's the story. Here's the, here's the drawing. Get somebody to ink it. You know, it's about such as uh, Chichala, his father, you know, his father died, so and so and so and so and so and so. So you got the panels up there, and he wrote in the panels. But that's not creating the character. And when I go back again to the, um, what they call the um, archives, dealing with Marvel comic books, the reason why you can tell that Stan Lee wasn't doing it, because Stan Lee didn't create one character worth anything before Jack Kirby and the rest of the guys got there. And after they left, he didn't create a character worth any note because he was the editor. He had other people. It's like the president of the United States. He doesn't know everything. He has advisors. He has an energy advisor. You know, he has an environmental advisor. Trump don't know nothing about the uh, the, the energy, energy, or the you know uh, uh, what's going on with the environment and things like that. They give him meetings if it is um, necessary for him to know something. Other than that, they're working on their own. And they'll come out and say, uh, "Mr. President, you we we need to make this speech about the you know uh, the rising tides or something like that." And he'll go then. He'll get his speech. They'll brief him on it, and he'll make some recommendation according to what his experts have told him, but he doesn't know everything. You all think that the president is supposed to be a smart guy. All he has to do is read the cue cards and look confident, act and act like he's mean when he needs to be mean, acts like he act like he, you know, kisses babies when that needs to be done. It's an actor. That's why Ronald Reagan was such a, was such a good president. Well, Ronald Reagan wasn't that great an actor, but um, it's acting. The guys that you see in the back that you don't know their names, that are standing there all the, t all the time, when President Obama was there, they were standing in the background, kind of like Henry Kissinger and stuff like that, although Henry Kissinger is like 400 years old now. But those guys who stand in the back don't stand up, don't say nothing. Not to see it. They're not CIA. 
They're just top level advisors from the folks at headquarters, you know, to make sure you don't do nothing stupid, say nothing wrong, and make sure that you are ever present there so that they know that the Kennedy solution can always happen. So traditionally, you're dealing with several African, you're dealing with a composite of African um, cultures. You know, of course, you're dealing with Zulu, you're dealing with Dogon, you're dealing with Dahomey, you know, the clothing suggested Nigeria also, uh, Kenya, of course. So you got a composite of Africa, the, the, the best of Africa, there in Wakanda. Now, of course, there's not an actual place called Wakanda on the African continent. In a parallel universe, there could be a Wakanda, but we won't go into that because um, that's a whole different section of knowledge that I would have to teach a long time on for folks to understand, you know, uh, some of that Mandela effect stuff, some of the transdimensional stuff, some of the things dealing with multiple realities and the multiverse and the infraparticle um, information in the sub, uh, subparticle, subatomic realms that create the macro universes that we live in. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, there's a Black Panther society. There's a Leopard society. It's like there's a Jaguar society in um, you know, South American things. The people take on their part of the land, so they take on the totems and the power of the land because they have a synergy or synergistic relationship with the land there. That's why the people who are who live around the crocodiles, the crocodile is their totem. They don't have a, a, a you know, if there's no uh, cobras there. They don't, they're not the cobra folks, but you have every powerful animal in a particular place that people live there, that's their doggone totem. They've learned how to live together. They made packs. The teacher told me that in, in his teacher's time, in his teacher's teacher's time, um, the, the neighborhood would have meetings. In other words, the lions would come out the lepers would come out, the human beings would come out, the baboons, the gorillas, and they'd all go gather around the, the water hole and the elders of the community, the elder baboons, the elder, elder chimpanzees, the elder uh, uh, cobras, they would all sit down. Nobody would bite anybody. Nobody would eat anybody. The falcons would come down. The bats would come in, and they'd have a meeting and talk together in the secret, sacred language that everybody knows so that you could talk to the lions, you could talk to the leopards, you could talk to the baboons. So when they would have these meetings, they would set boundaries and taboos and things like that. They say, you go up into the edge of the forest. From there on, you know, it's our land. Don't come past that unless you get a special pass. We'll give you the special pass. The special pass is a song. So when certain people get to the edge of the forest, they'll start singing a song, a special song, not because they happy and feel like singing a song, or maybe like this is a song that I'm just, it just popped into my head because I heard it on the CD or I heard it on the radio, so I'm just popping in my song. No, the song, the dance, all of those things have a higher purpose not just entertainment or happy dance. But you start singing that song. When you get to the edge of that woods, you sing the song. And so the leopards know that a human being is coming past. Don't eat it because it's part of the family of the neighborhood because they know the song. Now, if you don't got that song and you don't know and you're not part of that clan that they gave the song to that every boy and girl learns when they're young, that this is the song you sing when you get to the edge of the forest, you're a burger. We were back in the we, we were back in the back in the thick in the thick 
thick in the in the brush and things like that. They said, stay on the path. They said, okay, when night come, don't go out unless you go on this unless you go on the pee that far. <laughs> said, don't go out. So well, why why not? Why can't we go out? <laughs> they say, because there's things out there. And we didn't told them that there's strange that there's strangers in the village and not to eat y'all. But don't go, don't stray off the path. Don't take a step off this doggone path if you're going from here to someplace else and it's dark out here, even if it's light out here, stay on the path. You know, if a snake crossed the road, you wait till the snake finish crossing the road. You don't like go behind it or jump over it or nothing like that. You let the snake finish. If the snake is 20, 30 feet, 20, 30 feet long, you wait till that snake moves. They don't move them snakes. Then you go up to them holes in the ground. And, well, I mean, <laughs> y'all don't need to know all this stuff. But what I'm saying is, is that African culture is so deep, the hole ain't got no bottom to it. That's why they call it the 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 dark land. Not dark in the case of the dark continent, but dark in the case of that the secrets are hidden. That's why they have they still have cloaked cities in Africa. You got places that you that uh, outsiders they never been. The, pen, the the ground penetrating radar can't penetrate. Back in the places where they say there's still dinosaurs back there. And you don't know because the doggone tree canopies cover that stuff up. And the type of trees there emit a electromagnetic signal that the radar can't penetrate. They make all their movies about the expedition into the lost world and all that kind of stuff. It's right there. El Dorado. They said El Dorado. We thought it was South America. No, the lost world where, where the uh, <laughs> what was that? The 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 movie Guanji or something like that where they had they went down to South America and the dinosaurs were back up in there. No, it's in Africa. You know, you can still put the United States, Europe, and China and all that stuff into the African continent. The African continent is a big place. My mother always talking about, well, you're always going to Africa. It's, you know, they fighting over there. I said, you know how, I said, Ma, you know how big Africa is? I said, we closer to the fighting than where I'm going to be in Africa to the fighting. So, yes, there is a Black Panther. It ain't fantasy. Jack Kirby got that information through research about the Black Panther, about the Super Steel. The Dogon talk about the Super Steel Sagala. The steel that was forged when uh, Sirius B collapsed. The gravitational force crushed the atoms into a super steel. So the piece that is in some me is, is in some medias, you know, they're using that type of steel in what? They use it in they use it to make the royal chrises in uh, Indonesia, the ones that rattle in their own sheath and do their own fighting. <laughs> you know, where you think they got that uh, Frodo sting turns blue when orcs are about. Glowing swords, glowing crystals, you know, quantum weapons, quantum computers out of crystals. I was looking at a, um, uh, what's the two guys' name, talking about crystal technology, that, you know, crystals is just pseudoscience and metaphysics is not true and all that kind of stuff, you know, because, you know, a crystal is a, a uh, actual mineral, and it's not, you know, it, it's a physical thing, so it's part of the physical thing. I said to myself, now what if I had a hard drive? Just a hard drive. Now the hard drive got music on it. It's got Lord of the Rings, uh, movies with Della Reese in it, movies with uh, Betty Grable. Spike Lee is inside of this box, his movies. All of the different books on fishing and sword fighting and ice skating and all those type of things. And I just had a, you know, a hard drive. Or say a thousand years from now, 
Well, say a thousand years ago, because a thousand years ago, a thousand years from now, this technology will be will be old school and won't be no problem. But I'm saying, let's say a thousand years ago, and a guy says, "Here, you see this? This has all the information in the world in it. You just need the key to understand how to unlock that power." And they, you know, he's looking at this. And say, this ain't. I mean, it's shiny, look nice, but that ain't nothing. How you say, you say there's people inside of here and and writing? You say it's writing inside of this thing. I don't see no writing. I'm gonna break it open and look inside if I see the little if I see the writing and the people and all that kind of stuff in there. Because you don't know how to access the information. If you have a crystal, do you know that you could download more information into a crystal? than exist in millions and millions and billions of universes in one small speck of a, of a plain quartz crystal. In the Yiming Zoo, that organizes it on, a, on, a, on another level. But they're quantum computers. They're handing you this quartz crystal and, 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 you know, folks are doing rituals where they, they wave around, around they, you know, clean the house, house and stuff like that. Like, 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 access access the information inside, inside of it. So you got, so a, you got a crystal. People say, well, they don't do nothing. Don't, you know, what you do with it. You know, you know, you know, you know, but if you have a way to charge your thing up and be able to decipher the code on the screen to liberate that information. From, from the little the hard drive inside, inside of this, this, this black box, box. then you have it's something that's magical. magical, but you just don't know how to access it. You don't know how to turn it on. You don't know that it, um, the battery has to be charged and things like that. The information is there. The crystal is there. It has all that stuff in it. You just don't know how to, that. You just don't know where the turn on button is. You don't know how to plug it up and charge it. You don't know how to decipher the screen to be able to get to the movies and the books and those type of things because you don't know that language any longer. All of the people that know that language are dead a thousand years. So what do you do? You just got a piece of thing and you put it in the museum and you call it what you think it is. Quartz crystal or, the, or black, black, box, black shiny box made in, you know, 2018. You know, um, shows the cult shows the culture and craftsmanship of how they can make the rounded edges and uh, put a layer of um, of this clear glass on top of the metal and other things that are inside of it and the sketchings inside. You know, we've had our experts look at it inside, and we've seen these uh, ancient sacred marks from this unknown language <clears throat> from this unknown language that's inside of there certain etchings and markings, you know, to to decipher the, the knowledge on the etchings and markings, we took a microscope and we pulled these we pulled these pieces off and put them on a piece of paper and we're looking at them under the microscope trying to find out what this language what this language means. Not knowing that they've just jacked the phone up. If they got to a point to where they knew what they were doing enough to be able to turn it on, to charge it up, turn it on, decipher the characters on the front of it and look at the Black Panther on it. So, it's small. Don't worry about these things. The Marvel Universe is a mirror. And it's a mirror of um, several men who were very, very jacked in and hooked in. Jack Kirby all the Marvel characters he wanted to get rid of because he wanted to go cosmic with it. He wanted to go transdimensional with it. Stan Lee didn't understand that. They got into it. That's why he left and went to D.C. He wanted to take us to a different level. That was That's what it was about. Elevation into a new paradigm of knowledge and understanding. That's what the Marvel Universe was. It came at the right time to have the technology to be able to do things like the Black Panther that is being done for inspiration of the children that are looking at it. 
of course they look at i mean of course there's some uh, some things in there that I, <laughs> that I would have done differently and that were done differently in a comic book but inspiration possibility so the information was to be something that elevated the human spirit out of the human. You look at the Black Panther and you're saying, well, the, you know, the, the, you know, they had this vibranium, they had this stuff that could have liberated Africa. If Killmonger had got it, he could have destroyed white supremacy and things like that. Don't you know that white supremacy is dead from its own weight? We're still in the midst of it, yes. But it's obsolete. The artificial intelligence of the super quantum computers makes it obsolete because they don't care white, black, anything. You're a carbon-based, inefficient, dumb being to the AI. It don't matter. You're still flesh and blood. So Wakanda is going to be part of the Infinity Wars. That's what it's, that's what it's coming down to. People look at things and don't even know what to look at. They say that, okay, we got to put reins on the Avengers because of what? If you saw Civil War. Because the Scarlet Witch threw a bomb up in the air and some people got killed. But how many people would have been killed on the ground? How many people would have been killed if they had uh, released a biological weapon? It's the same thing they said, the Avengers tore up New York. But they forget that these extraterrestrials was coming through a wormhole. Into, what do you think they were going to do? They were just going to ride around and visit New York? No, they had come to tear some stuff up, to kill some folks, to destroy, because they came with weapons. If Iron Man and the rest of them had not checked them, then the world would probably have ended. But they weren't about to build it. Yes, people got killed, but those people and a lot more would have got killed if these um, extra-dimensional, trans-dimensional beings came through and started killing people, and you had nothing to encounter them with but some, some, uh, some bombs and hand grenades and, and things like that. The Marvel Universe, the cinematic universe, which the Black Panther is part of, is part of the Infinity Wars. You see, it looks like it starts out in Wakanda. And then you see the men fight too. Because where they had the daughters or the wives of the leopard, you had the men's uh, ranking also. You had the men's quarters also. You had the men warriors also. You just had all all female crew that were, in the opinions of the historians of the time and the people there, they were better than the men fighters with the weapons that they had. With the 24-inch top-heavy decapitating razors, they were more dexterous than the men um, fighters with their swords. They were faster and more dexterous in doing fine motor skills than the men, so they were faster. And they accepted pain to a greater degree than the men. So they were better than the, 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 the male troops or the men troops that were part of the Dahomean army. So Jack Kirby wanted to take us out into the cosmos. That was their first group. The Fantastic Four was Marvel's first successful comic. And the Fantastic Four is what takes them into the cosmic because the Fantastic Four are so they're superheroes, but they're more explorers than they are. Just fight everybody all the time, because those that's where the Eternals and the Galactus and uh, Thanos and all these different other above God grade folks, the one above all, all these type of uh, characters that are that are multidimensional, that are transdimensional, that have powers beyond the scope of uh, human thought and things like that. That's what Jack Kirby and the Marvel Universe were taking, taking us, and Wakanda is going to be part of that because what Wakanda do is bigger than Africa. It's bigger than this planet because we're moving out 
of the earthly realms into the multidimensional realms. That means outer space, that means inner space, that means the dimensions that are close, closer than the sweat on your skin, but a completely different set of arrangements and things like that that are part of this. We're seeing the last generation of human beings. You're going to see all different types of new and exotic things that are going on in the world. The robots, the artificial intelligence, you know, you think, you, you, you think things are crazy now. They'll be, they're going to have robots that are mostly for, of course, uh, sex, companionship, work, and all those different types of things. They'll have children robots for the pedophiles so that they don't have to be with an actual child. They could be with a robot child. Multiple being, therianthropes, chimeras. Don't you ever see those uh, um, sci-fi movies where you see the sci-fi and the, uh, the women got three breasts perfectly aligned. They have the ability to make all that stuff right now with the, with the CRISPR and gene editing and all that kind of stuff. They can make that stuff now. They can make a baby with one green eye and one orange eye with yellow hair on one side and blue hair on the other side, half of it green, the other side orange. Eight foot tall, eight hundred and fifty pounds, like the like the Hulk. All of the things that the comic books, the comic books were never just, you know, just fantasy. So yes, there are there are movies coming out that are from the pulp fiction that are from the future, you know, they're bringing out they're bringing out the new predator. They get ready to start on the new predator. They get ready to start on uh, Doc Savage with the Rock. Doc Savage is the early precursor of a lot of the superheroes, the first Superman, you know, and I think uh, H R H R Haggard, you know, King Solomon's Mind, Night of the Lily, Alan Quatermain. All those different stories that uh, the adventure stories that were um, at the early part of the century and things like that, all that's pulp fiction and in the mythology of modern the modern world. Umslopogus and Okosikas, the woodpecker. Didn't y'all read this stuff when you were kids? I know the kids now haven't. Because they, you know, they look at YouTube. So, the Black Panther. I enjoyed the movie. <laughs> I think it was uh, well done, well thought out. The clothing and colors and the, uh, the people. Um, I think it was all great. But don't, by any stretch of the imagination, think that Africa does not have or hasn't had in the past high technologies waiting to be. Um, rediscovered or waiting to be revealed because like I said before there are cloaked cities in Africa just like Wakanda was cloaked they probably got that off my uh, off one of my old uh, DVDs or tapes or something like that from the 19 from the early 80s and things like that when I was talking that stuff and everybody was well you sound kind of crazy you know when I was talking about shape shifting and turning into different animals and all that kind of stuff. And people are telling me, well, only the Chinese do that. They ain't no panther. They don't do that. In Africa, they got the claws just like the ninjas. They got, the, you know, the, the leopard claws, the leopard feet to leave the leopard prints so that folks, when something happened and the leopard has done his business, they think it's a, a real leopard uh, lurking in the area. The silent killer. Once you see it, you're already dead. Because all you see is the flash of teeth. 
So shape shifting, you know, turning into the monkey, turning into the leopard, turning into the crocodile, showing your magic, showing your power. Where they get the medicine and they put the guys up and shoot the guns at them, try to cut them with the uh, cut them with the knives, or they take them. You know, I, you know, you take the kung fu guys when they take the the skin and they put a uh, you know a barbecue skew through the skin and the neck and things like that. But no, them them brothers in the them brothers in the dense part of Africa in the Congo will be taking spikes and putting it <laughs> putting it through their chest. You know, taking one and and take a steel spike and put through their temple all the way through the other part of their head and all that kind of stuff. Cut their arm off and put it back on. Flying and then flying around the doggone fires at night and stuff like that. Those fishermen who have that the the command over the fish and over the water, going under under the under the water, uh, and stay on stay down there for an hour, or two hours, and things like that. Then come back out, having contests who can stay who can stay down there the, the longest, lay down there two and three hours. Who can jump to the top of the tree and come back down without killing themselves the fastest? All of that kind of stuff. That's all in them contests, them wizard contests. You know, going to the raffia hut and somebody takes some some uh, some kerosene and pour it on the raffia, and you and sitting in the middle of the hut, and they throw a match in there and it start to burn it. Then you hear the song start. Then you hear the song start to singing, and then the hut burn down to ashes. And they start, and they play the drum. The they they play the drum beats. Excuse me, the beats. I keep saying beats. I don't know why. They play the tones. And call him up, and he come dancing up out the ashes, smoking. Don't tell me nothing about. Don't tell me nothing about Africa. You ain't never, you ain't never ain't never been to Africa. Most people that go to Africa ain't never been to Africa. They go there and they at the Hilton and the Novotel and. You know, sitting on the beach and riding in the air-conditioned bus and all that kind of stuff. Nope. We didn't been out in the bush. And I got people who have been there that can testify that we've been out in the bush. So when you talk about the Black Panther or the Panther and things like that, we didn't been out in the bush with Panthers and with the... Uh, uh, cobras and uh, all different kind of things out there. You know, it's a monkey that live behind the house. If you get too, you get too close to that swamp, <laughs> you dead as Abraham Lincoln. You get too close to the getting too close to the girls. So yes, we do animal mimicry. We do changing into the animals. Make poisons to put on the knives and swords and darts and thorns and pins. All that's part of the martial arts. You have to be able to fight where you are not touched because if you're touched, you're dead. If you're touched, Let alone getting stuck by some, stuck by a knife or cut by the sword. I'm talking about if you're touched, you're dead. So this is the type of martial art I'm talking about. I'm talking about the real stuff. So most of the folks who are my, you know, martial arts buddies, they don't want no part of the a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, some don't believe. Some straight up scared. You know, because in Africa it's still real. You know. They said for a long time that there were no, that Africa was sparse in hallucinogenic plants. Now, it was budded with South America. <laughs> and then when the continent started to drift away, you know, you think the rainforest got anything different in South America than the rainforest got in Africa? Yeah, some plants died out because of climactic changes, because of uh, things like the meteor 12,600 uh, BCE that hit the earth and the North American ice shelf, busted all that ice up, heated it up, threw steam up, 
water, fresh water into the salt water that stopped the that slowed down the current, which changed the um, climate, started making it drier, still even in the midst of the drying, because the Sahara had been drying for over a million years. All the lakes, tributaries, rivers, streams, and large bodies of water that had people spread out all over the top of the doggone uh, continent of Africa started getting drier and drier and drier, drier and drier and drier. And it pushed people to the water. When the stream drive up, where you go? You go to the Nile. And what happens to the Nile? The Nile has the inundation period before they change the course of the Nile and stop the inundation period. It would bring all the exotic minerals down from the highlands in the interior of Africa and drag that 4,000 miles, lay that silt with those with that oramus and monatomic gold and platinum and ruthenium and rhodium and iridium and all those different type of things were in the soil and the people ate that stuff in the soil and the priests took it into the temples and refined it into that white powder that went with the black powder that went the red with, that went with the red powder powder the black powder is the same medicine that they use that um, uh, the Akan used and uh, they use in Nigeria, the medicine that they put in the cuts, that black medicine, powdered down. And they take the original medicine they brought from the Sirius star system, the planet of Fe, where you get Ile-Ife. Ile-Ife is in reverence to Fe in the Sirius star system. When those folks came out of the Sirius star system, landed on Mars, fought for uh, probably 100,000 years before they sent the women here. The women stayed there 80,000 years before the men got here. We got hit by three meteors, blown back to the Stone Age, recovered three times, and then this last little piece of meteor that came, 12,600 BCE, drowned out places like Atlantis and all that kind of stuff. And I know people are going to say, well, Kalindi's talking pseudoscience because we just, we know that there was no uh, real Atlantis. It may not have been called Atlantis. It was the big doggone half a piece of continent sitting out in the Atlantic Ocean that was a super civilization. Exact time that Plato talked about his ancestor, um, Oh man, was it Solon or what? I can't think of the name of who the ancestor was right now. But he said that he learned in Egypt or in Kemet that 9,000 years prior to them standing there talking, which was 12,600 BCE, they said that a cataclysm happened and that Atlantis sunk. Not just Atlantis, every, every seaside civilization, a big city that was on the shore, got sunk. Africa set up on a plate. They moved from the drying into the Nile Valley. You know, the people, the other folks moved into the Tigris Euphrates area, and other people around the world moved back. The Indonesian archipelago, which is a series of different islands, Many of the pyramids and high civilizations and stuff like that sank at the same time Atlantis did. They found that road with the with the uh, the satellite imagery. They found that road that Hanuman, the Monkey King, created between uh, <laughs> to to uh, from India to Sri Lanka. They found the road under the doggone ocean. Under the doggone ocean from the Ramayana. Lord Rama. So the Indonesian archipelago, the Philippines, all of those high cultures got swept under the water and people moved to the, to the uh, piece of land which was the island that was left. So don't tell me nothing about no Black Panther. I know about the Black Panther. I know about them regular Panthers too. And I also understand and know that there's no coincidence with all of this stuff and the hidden imagery that they are hooking up with the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense. You know, 
you could have came. You could have said that them little boys could have been, could have been playing basketball in Chicago or Detroit or Cleveland or any place. They didn't do Oakland for no reason at all. They don't make that chair with T'Challa in it and the chair with Huey P. Newton sitting in it. It's no accident for that. And the and the the spear and shield that is right beside the chair of Huey Newton. That's the spear and shield that T'Challa was using when he was fighting. Um, Killmonger. He had the shield and the spear. So, no, that's not a coincidence. You know, not a coincidence. But this thing is bigger than what we think. Not just because it's going to be a billion dollar movie, it's going to change the paradigm of Hollywood. You know, they're getting ready to come out with, uh, you know, they say they're coming out with this Black Panther thing. Let us do Coming to America too. So they're talking about doing coming to America too, um, and that's going to be a big movie. That's going to be a big movie also. Um, but don't think that uh, there is no Black Panther, because there is. There are many Black Panthers. Um, don't disregard or disrespect the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Um, it's part of our history. Uh, part of our glorious history. So uh, all of those um, hidden things, subliminal things are there. It's to invoke memory, it's to invoke um, emotions and things like that along with the movie. Because you hook a real emotion with the celluloid and it'll, all, it'll always be connected. So um, Yes, there's still secrets. There are cloaked cities where you go in and, you know, it looks like a regular village. You got to walk a mile down to the down the hill to get water and or go to the well and, you know, pull water up in the well, stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of flies around and stuff like that. Um, look like people, uh, you know, aren't really doing that good. But they don't live in that village. They live in another village, a bigger village. And you know what a bigger village is? It's in the smaller villages in the shrine inside of the sacred house of the village. That's the whole thing of the fractals. That's the whole thing of the fractal village. You have the um, macro village that we live in. And in the shrine house, you have another village, a little village. That's exactly in the spot of the Shrine House. And in that little village, there's another village inside of that that has a Shrine House with another smaller village into it. And that goes all the way down below the plank length until it gets to the other side and it starts growing again and becomes the village that you originally went in. I know y'all missed that. Um... Some not everybody missed it, but you know, um, that's that's what we're talking about. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. That's my two cents. Baba Kalindi uh, signing off. We have uh, this Thursday on Blog Talk. We have a um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the things that we're talking about. We're going to put in another two cents. Um, also, know that we have the Food of the Gods retreat coming up June 14th, 15th, and 16th in uh, outside of Oaxaca in the mountains where we'll be smoking the toad and eating the sacred thunder landslide mushrooms on the side of the mountain in Mexico. Um, and then we have the Detroit Psychedelic Conference August 10th 11th and 12th in the city of Detroit. We'll have speakers from all over, um, from all over, from the UK and Europe, from uh, Africa, from the United States, you know, maybe not every place, but we, we're, we're starting to bring in a few people. Hopefully, um, by the time everything is solidified, people will be coming in. Uh, we uh, like to say thank you for listening. Um, uh, thank you for your continued support, and I'll see you all soon.
Peace.